we are ready to get the final game underway. A sellout crowd here at the Kingdome here this afternoon. Swing and a drive, there it goes! And Junior comes through, that is baseball theater. Holy cow, he got it! Everything happening strange on this last day of the Kingdome. Flash bombs going off, you would think the Mariners had just won the World Series. It was a great ball game, we saw a little bit of everything in it, and King Griffey Jr. came to steal the spotlight. And an era is over! The final game at Seattle's legendary Kingdome in June of 99 is the inaugural installment of a new series on YouTube called Hidden Classics. Series debut features that memorable final game at the Kingdome. One of the voices that you heard in those highlights is the voice of our next guest. We're going to talk about this game, this franchise, and this building a lot. Can't wait to watch this series, by the way, available on YouTube. Hidden classics, thrilling games from decades gone by for many kids that are watching for the first time. We remember those days, <laughs> as does Rick Riz. <laughs> 51 years Mike side in the sport, 39 of those with the Seattle Mariners, and Rick joins us on this Thursday morning. Rick, great to see you. Good morning. Matty, great to see you and Ron. It's always nice to talk about our history and the kingdom and uh, – Always a lot of fun. I appreciate what you guys do for all baseball fans. Every time I wake up in the morning, I tune you guys in. So thank you very much. Uh, it's nice of you to say. And, and before we drill down on that final game, I just want to hit you on the Kingdom a big picture here. Because yeah. during its lifespan, it was bemoaned as this awkward place with a weird surface. And it was dark mm -hmm. and it was uncomfortable, <laughs> etc. And then uh, it goes away and we miss it somehow. <laughs> How does that happen? Well, I think the same guy that uh, was the architect for the Roman Coliseum was the same guy who designed the kingdom. <laughs> but somehow they put a concrete roof on it. It's a miracle. I mean, the original company that built the kingdom couldn't figure out how to put the concrete dome on it. And another company had to come in and do that. But anyway, you know, it was, um, of course, a multi-purpose stadium. We had the Mariners. We had uh, the Seahawks, of course, there. The Sonics played basketball games in there. The Sounders played the first game there in 1976. You had monster trucks. You had tractor poles. You had conventions, motocross, everything in that ballpark. It was anything but a ballpark. But in 1992, Maddie and Ronnie, we made it a ballpark because it was the first time we got to the playoffs uh, in 1995. It was the team and the guys that helped save baseball in Seattle. So it made it our ballpark. But then when we imploded it, you know, a number of years later, Danny Wilson and I were in the clubhouse in Peoria, Arizona at spring training. It was March, and it went down in like 19 seconds. Danny and I are watching the implosion, and we're both getting emotional. We're both kind of crying. I go, Danny, you cried? He says, you cried? I go, because it was our home. It <laughs> yeah. wasn't Fenway Park. It wasn't Yankee Stadium. But, but guys, we made it our ballpark in 1995. Mm. You know, Rick, well, what's interesting about the kingdom, my memories of it, is that because it was in such an industrial district, there wasn't a lot of stuff around. But yep. they used to have a little pub there called Swanee's. And at yes. Swanee's, what they would do <laughs> is the street level was Swanee's pub. Uh, the bottom level was a, a comedy club. And mm -hmm. what was great about it, Dave Valley. Oh, uh, boy, I knew uh, you were going to go there. A, a, a great catcher uh, for the Mariners. But he was going through some hitting problems at the time. And what they would do at this pub is they would charge a draft beer with whatever Valley was hitting at the time. <laughs> I think it's one of the great yeah. stories ever revolving around a ballpark. Yeah, Dave thought it was great, too. <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> <he did. laughs> But, you know, that was a great place. Wine was a great place. There was also a place right across the kingdom, too, in Occidental. But, man, if those walls could talk, because, you know, guys would go down there after games and have a, have a wonderful time. Jim Swanson was a left-handed catcher. He was on that Portland Mavericks team many years ago, and there's a movie about it, mm -hmm. you know, about that ball club. But we had so much fun in there. The guys would come in there. I, I played uh, Galaga with uh, Frank White one night for hours, you know, and the, and it was just just so much fun. Baseball fans in there, and it was a great time. But Swanee's was the place, 
and Pioneer Square where Ronnie to go to to have a good time after a ball game. Yeah, the postscript to that story are the number of nights that uh, Val went into Swanee's with a fungo bat <laughs> <That's> threatening <laughs> to break all the taps. Uh, hey, Rick, I, I do want to ask you specifically about this game that's the first installment of Hidden Classics, the final game yeah. ever at the Kingdome. What made it so unusual just to start before a pitch was even thrown is that it was in the middle of the season. And we recall yeah. the M's changing ballparks in June of 1999, such a difficult proposition. How did that affect the climate and the, the fan base, knowing that the final game was in the middle of a season at the Dome? Yeah, we had a sellout crowd, 56,530 fans, you know, came out to, uh, to see the final game at the Kingdom. We we're playing the Texas Rangers. And we were just so excited to move into a new ballpark. And it was a ballpark, it was the first time Generations of fans in Seattle and the Pacific Northwest were going to see a game on real grass outside because uh, at the time, Safeco Field, now T-Mobile Park, was going to have a retractable roof. But in the final game in the Kingdom, Ken Griffey Jr. always did wonderful things. Here he is hitting a three-run home run in the bottom of the first inning. Rusty Greer hit a, a home run early in the ball game. Jr. took that home run away from Juan Gonzalez in the bottom of the fourth inning. Then after the ball game, there was confetti came down, not yet, but uh, it was just um, an amazing sight to see the fans in the Pacific Northwest to say goodbye to our ballpark. It, it was sad, but we couldn't wait to move into our new home. And we went on a road trip for about uh, two weeks. We had a 12 or 13 game road trip. And when we came back, we played on the most, on the most beautiful field, green grass, blue skies, like baseball was meant to be played. And we couldn't move into our, couldn't wait to move into our new ballpark. But uh, we enjoyed our time in the Kingdom. It was a lot of fun there, with a lot of great memories to see a, a young Ken Griffey Jr. come up to the big leagues in 1989. The first game of the Kingdom, Diego Segui threw the first pitch to Jerry Remy. Remember, Dave Niehaus told me that uh, the Angels, uh, Frank Tanana, shut him out in the first game. Nolan Ryan shut him out in the second game. And then Dave said, "I didn't think we were going to score a run all year long, but they won the third game in a five-game series." So oh, they had their moments in the kingdom, but we couldn't wait to get into the most beautiful ballpark, I think, now in baseball and in T-Mobile Park. You know, but you that was an amazing game. Sorry, Rick, you mentioned that uh, you almost had 57,000 uh, for that last game. When it was sold out, give uh, the people that watch this show a feel of how loud, I remember how loud that stadium could become. Ronnie, it was amazing. You know, 56,000 that night, but I got to go back to the 1995 season. When uh, Ken Griffey Jr. shattered his wrist, ran into the Kingdom Wall and right center field on about May 29th of 1995, Kevin Bass for playing Baltimore, hit a fly ball to right center field. Jr. was just fearless. Full head of steam, slammed into the wall in right center field, but this time was different. He fell down to the warning track. He knew something was seriously wrong. He shattered his wrist. It took a plate and seven screws to put his wrist back together again. And they were wondering, what are we going to do without Junior? Well, they hung in there. Edgar Martinez hit 400 during that span. And Mike Blowers hit home runs and drove in runs like crazy. Randy Johnson. So they kept on going, and, and they made it to uh, uh, Junior came back in August of that year. And, and we started to really draw fans, Ronnie, to answer your question, in September. When we kept winning and the Angels kept losing, all of a sudden we're drawing 20,000 fans, 25,000, 35,000. And then toward the end of the year, when the Rangers came to town, it was so loud. I, Dave Niehaus couldn't hear me. I was sitting right next to him. There's Brian Hunter catching a ball out there in left center field. Danny Wilson was awesome. Lou Pinella taught these guys how to win. I'd have to yell in Dave's ear right next to me, hey, so-and-so, Norm's warming up in the bullpen. The sheriff's warming up in the bullpen. You couldn't hear yourself think. Wow. Uh, the fans raised the roof, and uh, mm -hmm. they helped save baseball in Seattle, too. But the way they showed out and convinced Major League Baseball that we could survive in the Northwest with a new ballpark, and eventually we got it a few years later. Man, uh, you know, there's so many uh, kind of micro moments at the Kingdom that we could ask you about. I want to hit you on one of them, and we'll take you back sure. to 1989. We run this often on the network because Harold <laughs> loves to tell the story, of course, and Harold's not here to do it. We're live. Yeah, so we're, we're live. Let, You're you know, in Vegas, of course, being thrown oh. out by Bo Jackson. Fake news. It's not fake news, Harold. I know you'd like to think this never took place, but that's just, it still boggles our mind, Rick. Uh, Maddie and Ronnie, it was one of the greatest throws I've ever seen by one of the most incredible athletes <laughs> I've ever seen. Harold's sitting there right now 
still thinking about how in the world did he throw me out? And I remember Harold telling me he's rounding 30s thinking I'm going to score easily. Scott Bradley hit that ball down the left field line. And he said, I'm racing home, and I see Darnell Coles telling me he hit the deck. He goes, what? And then here's that throw. It's perfect on the line. There was no hump in that throw from Bo Jackson all the way to Bob Boone. I talked to Bob Boone this spring. We were in the clubhouse having uh, breakfast with uh, Brent earlier this year. And it was a perfect throw. Boone went and got it and made the tag. And uh, Harold was more surprised than anybody in the kingdom that night. But that's one of the greatest athletes I've ever seen right there in Bo Jackson. It was a great play. Oh, but that might be the best 30 seconds on that play I've ever heard, too. And then seeing Harold at the airport after they released him and sent him to Tacoma was, was it really, it, it paid it all off. Uh, hey, Rick, we really the appreciate curl working too. The curl, oh, yeah, yeah, the curl was, was on point. We really appreciate the visit, Rick. Uh, we can't wait to watch this, this whole series. And kicking it off with the final game at the, uh, at the kingdom and getting your take on it, really a, a pleasure for us. Thanks again. Happy Thanksgiving to you and your family, and we look forward to visiting with you down the road.